talk. Yeah. Well, well, ten years ago, you know, I took my daughter, and, and where was I? I? Was on the desert, and she said, "Mom, where are we going?" No, I, it wasn't the desert. It was in Beverly Hills, and there are four corners, and one belonged to, uh, to uh, Corey and Griffith. And it was a familiar spot, and I was creeping along with my car, and I found a place to park. And she said, Mom, where are we really going? And I said, quiet. And we got out, and I snuck through a back door into a place that was full of little tables with gold chairs, you can imagine, and, and uh, little things that people were t uh, having glasses this high with a lot of cream and stuff on them. I rushed in, took the first seat with my back to the audience, and faced her, and she said, Mother, how dare you? Shame on you. I'm going to tell on you. And I said, don't you dare. <laughs> and then when they came, I said, I want a chocolate ice cream soda with vanilla ice cream. Live from New York, we are eavesdropping like, on an intimate conversation <laughs> with friends of Gloria Swanson. Doing something I shouldn't be doing. They are Dick Gregory. I felt like a guy. Consumer editor and former Pennsylvania Insurance Commissioner Herb Denenberg. Broadway and film producer Arthur Whitelaw. Frank Nicholas, chairman of the board and president of the Baker Beechnut Corporation. And William Dufty, best selling author and husband of Miss Swanson. You go upstairs and wash your face, I'll go upstairs and wash my face in my room, and I'll meet you down in the pump room in about 15 minutes and we'll have a chocolate ice cream sundae. Do they have them in the pump room? Sure. They did? Yeah. Thank God there was nobody around to see us doing it. Oh, sure. you mean we had a screen around? Something like that. Well, I guess I won the battle at home the, uh, about two weeks ago. I looked at one of my small daughters, and I said, hey, come here. And she walked up. She said, what do you want? I said, give me some sugar. And she looked at me and she said, what's that? Good. Uh, we oh, never, we good never, that, right? never had sugar in the house. That's great. And she oh. said, what's that? You know, we, we have, have a similar <laughs> we have a similar experience. We have a four-year-old daughter. She'll be four-year-old next week. And uh, we've never permitted her to have sugar in the house. No candy, no beverages with sugar in it, no iced tea mix, nothing of that nature. And about three months ago, she visited a friend of hers, her age, went to the friend's house, she was given a piece of chocolate candy, and my daughter bit into the chocolate and said, "Yuck! I don't like that." Oh, isn't that what? Yeah, the taste, the taste just hadn't boring. had just hadn't had that experience. Yeah, well, we we know a Japanese a couple who lived here some time, and of course the child, their children had the proper Oriental food, and then she went to school. One day she came back, and her face was swollen. Her nose was all red, her face, her eyes, and she looked like she'd been in a fight. So, the mother. Couldn't get anything out of her. What had happened? Was she dead? Had she been hurt? No, and she was very shy about the Daddy asked her about it, and finally, they got it out of her. She had had some ice cream, and she had broken yeah, out, and her face had gotten all had swollen that, up. I had one that popsicle happen. is enough to do it. Yeah, I had that happen to my, my oldest son. I guess he's nine now at this time. I guess he was about five or six. We were traveling together. <clears throat> and, you, you know, I try to remember my childhood of you know certain religious beliefs that mama had you know they'll force it on you without explaining it to you and you end up with more hang-ups than than the beauty of mm -hmm. what they're trying to say and <clears throat> we were traveling two of us and he said daddy i want i want a chocolate sunday i said you ever had one he says no and i said well let me tell you what it is and then we'll get one and i got one and under the belief that if you're going to try it, try it at home. See, it was so many things when I was a kid you couldn't try at home. It's the worst so, many, so many things I couldn't ask my parents. So then you go out in the street and you ask someone on the corner that don't have the love and affection for you. And, and something I've learned, I have ten kids, and I've learned something from my child. I try to relate back when I was a kid, you know, and all the things that my parents said or did to me that didn't work. Right. And then don't bring them into the house. You sure. see, we try to raise kids today from a standpoint that we were never a kid. And you know, like spanking me never changed nothing. It made me slicker. I knew I couldn't do it in front of mom. Mm. But one thing I learned from my childhood as an adult raising a family is that no child will never ever lie to you to telling you the truth gets them in trouble. Mm -hmm. 
then you have to be very, very careful. Now, you end up with an honesty sometime that rocks you. You just have to sit there and listen to it. So we, we I got in this, this Sunday, and he ate three spoons full, and he, he didn't want any more. And I said, well, that's really what it's all about, son. That's your first time you've had ice cream, the first time you've had sugar, the first time you've had chocolate. We got home, and about two weeks later, he had an ear infection. And he looked down into the ear. It was like a volcano bubbling. Mm -hmm. And about four days after that, all the other kids he come in contact with had little balls and blisters on them. Now, the way you, the way you realize this, you know, they have research now that proves that the non-smoker is more affected by cigarette smoke than the smoker. Okay, so you look at this the same way with, with kids or a person that's been pure, that the first time you violate yourself, you get a radical reaction. Sure. But, you know, it, it'll throw it off, but it's a radical reaction. Like this same son of mine about three months ago, his hair started falling out. And I don't mean just in pieces, just spots, a blank spot, like it had never been no hair How there he? before. He's nine now. And, you know, everybody got upset. And uh, I didn't worry about it too much. I told Lil, I said, take him to your chiropractor and, and I'll talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> so I sat down and I told him, I said, without asking him, because he's so frightened now, and I don't want him to lie to me. So I said, Gregory, I could be wrong, but it, this might come from something that you ate. Now, if it have, and you keep eating it, there's a possibility you lose all your hair. I mean, just bald spots, and he was really upset over it. He just came out all at once. And so I said, now, if whatever it is, now, it might not be. If it's not, we can find it. But there's no one we can take you to that will treat you for one thing and it's all together something else. I really think it comes from something that you ate. Now, here's all I'm telling you. Whatever it is, stop it. And your hair come back. I flew into Boston and went home for a few hours. And my wife says, here, I want to show you something. And she said, look at Gregory's hair. And when you touch it, it's the same texture of a newborn baby where, where it grew back. And so I told her on the way out, coming to New York, I said, I'll tell you what you do. In a very comfortable atmosphere, very comfortable, try to see if you can relax him enough that he'll tell you what it was. What it was because then we can use it for research. Mm -hmm. But not to the extent where he thinks it's something wrong, where, you know, he's uptight over it. And so it's, it's very true. Mm -hmm. I look at a clean body the same way I look if we were all sitting here with a white outfit on. Mm -hmm. The least amount of dust on the chair, you pick it up, but that's a signal. It's that's there. why that's why people in restaurants and hospitals and places like that, when they wear white outfits, it means the minute a speck of dirt get on it, you can tell it. Well, the body's the same way. The pure your body is. The first time you violate, it will come out. I had one daughter woke up one morning, I guess she was about four years old, and she couldn't open up her eyes. Imagine the trauma a kid goes through, you open them and they don't open, right? Mm -hmm. And I hear hollering and screaming, my wife is all upset, and all the kids is upset, and we go in and her eyes is glued, just like someone had sprinkled glue on them, but it looked like paste. And I said, dear, don't worry about it. We're gonna get some water and a little cotton, and we're gonna soften this up because it's hard. And all it is is something you ate, and it came out of your body. And she said, yes, I had a piece of candy. Mm -hmm. But that was the violent, the violent reaction. And that's why if you have kids, that's pure. From birth, from day one, it is very, very important that you spend the time to, to inform them, not frighten them, not scare them, but inform those kids that the first time you put something in your body wrong, you're going to get a reaction. Now, it's not going to kill you. And it's a you. good reaction. It you is. Should. Sure. It's an alarm. Because that's why it's coming out. Well, of course it's an alarm. This is why if you have a headache, you mustn't stop it with an aspirin. Sure. You must find out why you have it. Or if you have a pain somewhere, find out why you have it. This business of going to a doctor and having them give you a painkiller, this is insanity. Yeah. Then you never know. It's like going to a house it's got a fire and you, and the, you ring for the firemen they come in and turn the alarm off and walk out without finding yeah. out where the fire of course, is it's almost impossible to find out what's going on now they thousands of additives in the food pcbs pesticides right, yes. you really don't know you don't, what yes. you're eating it's just outrageous. in fact the uh, food manufacturers i hate to bring this up with you around frank oh not at all <laughs> but they have lied to us in such a fashion that even if you read the label it doesn't do you yeah. any good in other words they'll say uh, artificial color but they won't tell you which one it is and many foods don't even oh, they'll the say without sugar, but that doesn't mean it doesn't yeah. have some kind of oh, a synthetic sweetener. Yeah. sweetener in it. 
That's another one they're doing. And that's, and that's very critical because you have a lot of people that are under the assumption, if you read a label that says no sugar added, mm -hmm. then they assume that's safe. People with sugar diabetes, but no sugar added means it has an artificial sweetener the, when it says unsweetened. Are, are you aware of what Frank is doing? I mean, uh, in this... Uh, Beach nut thing of changing it completely yeah, around, fact, like a, a hairpin turn. Mm. All the information I see on you, it says, uh, it, it says, oh God, I, I want to remember the word, how it was worded. It sounds like all the salt wasn't taken out. Are you, are you oh, no, aware? no, no, we have taken all of the added salt. Oh, okay, that's what, you're right. There it is says, enough salt found naturally in food products right. to provide the body with the requirements that the body needs. Okay. That zucchini is loaded with salt. All right, now let me no. tell you something. Previously. The student. way you run these on your PR that comes out, it don't read like that. For everyone that knows this, it sounds like, because when I read mm. it, it sounds like to me that it had to be a minimum amount of salt in it for no. taste. No. You see... Do you know the exact word in yes, all that? Yes. Uh, mothers, you, you understand, the baby food producers have been making baby foods for the mothers right. and not for the babies That's right, yes. because when the mother tastes the baby food if it that's tastes great to her, sure. she says, that's hey, sure. hey, that's great for my that's baby. Sure. She doesn't yeah, like but that. when in point of fact the mother's taste has been matured, that's a nice sure. word, it's a euphemism, yeah. it, should, it actually is warped yeah. by MSG, HVP, mm -hmm. seasoning, salt, spices and a lot of other things. Sure. Now, the mother expects that the salt will be in there and all of these other additives. When in, when in point of fact, the producers of baby food have been making baby food to satisfy the mother. Sure. How and did you start? What, what, what happened that turned that whole, well, whole company It's a very around? interesting thing. About two years ago, literature started to develop, uh, medical literature, research information, uh, scientific uh, papers started to come out which said that added salt was bad just pure sure. bad it, did they mention what kind of salt regular table salt or did they say sea salt but any they we, any technically salt, they yeah. referred to it as sodium yeah yes there's bad because it caused problems with hypertension high blood pressure and some said kidney problems so we said how how totally ridiculous the producers of baby food, and we count ourselves among them, I should qualify that to the fact that two other gentlemen and I, uh, four years ago, acquired the beech nut baby food mm -hmm. business. And at that time, we used to have taste panels. We would take one new product, which was made the same way, and we'd get 20 gals in there, and each one of them would taste it. And one gal would say, hey, that's a little, little, little flat. You better add a little sugar. Another said, add a little salt. And how about some? <laughs> and they all had a different interpretation of that same baby food product. But we made the decision that the added salt, uh, and we felt that it was scientific proof that it did, in fact, cause sure. problems. So we removed all added salt from all of our baby food. We have absolutely no added salt. Now, there is salt found naturally sure. in the food, which is sufficient. And we took all of the added sugar, Bill, this is your area, all of the added sugar out of 84 of our products. The only place we have sugar is in those products where it is the, the product would be so tart, such as in an apricot or a plum, that it would not be possible to eat the product. But the reaction that we have had and, and, and uh, Dick, in the area where you indicated that there's a possible misunderstanding, yeah. this could be from local editors who have picked up stories yeah. right, and yeah. have twisted them. I'm somewhat amazed at how some journalists right, will take yeah. a given fact and an attempt to embellish it with their own personality. Especially when own. it's scientifically. So yeah. This stuff has to and, go through my union, you know. And, and, and then, <laughs> yeah. oh, well, is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. Sound well, like that, that's all right, but when they have you dead, or you, they have you going, a doctor won't let you do something, and you don't even have a doctor, mm -hmm. then it gets a little difficult. Were you going to do this with all your food products? I mean, if you do it with baby food, why don't you do it with everything? Well, actually, we, 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 only, you make gum we just too. make baby food. Oh, we do not make gum. You're not gum. related to the other We do not make the gum. Initially, Beech Nut made a wide variety of food products since 1891 but in 1931 they began to make baby food principally baby food and then gum beech nut gum and beech nut candy and then later they acquired 
uh, the Lifesavers Company, but we are just in the baby food business. Mm -hmm. But you know that I'm using that now for a dessert because Bill makes the most wonderful crepes, and you can put some of the baby uh, the pineapple is awfully good, and uh, so is the uh, pear. And some of the others, I'm going to have them uh, there because we, you can't, we, can't always have them. We sell an incredible amount of junior food. This is a larger size oh, jar. Can we call me Junior then? Oh, yes. <laughs> that's, my, that's my title. Oh, that's right. Okay. We call you Commissioner. Yes, yeah. I, yeah, and you're a Commissioner. Then. Right. You're both, I can't think of you as a Commissioner for some reason. I can't think of a beautiful woman as a commissioner. It well, just bothers me. She got her me. badge on. You should have had your badge. <laughs> I had it with me. I should have put It's easy on. for her to get her point across. <laughs> well, how, about, how about calling it swinging singles, single jazz, pairs, you know? That's, that's good. <laughs> how long have you been a commissioner? Man? How long have I been yeah. a commissioner? Oh, let me see. That was last year I was made a commissioner. Commissioner of what? Youth and physical youth fitness? Youth and physical fitness. But you see, when people say this, they don't take in the fact that it must be, when they say physical, they think of calisthenics, sure. you see. They don't think of the food you put in this hole on your face, which is to me more important almost than the physical, except the two go together and should go together. So I'm waiting until we do this school thing that Bill and I are involved in up at the 175th Street, is it? Ninth it's District, District 9 of the, mm -hmm. uh, in the Bronx. Yes. Where there are lots of black youngsters and Puerto Ricans and uh, some whites, and we're going to try to find out what their food, ethnic food yeah. is, and then go along with that. Well, you know, I... And, excuse me, just let me finish, but when we finish that, then, then we're going to go right down to the mayor's office, at least I am. <laughs> and show them, because they, all, they always want proof, they always want statistics, and uh, that's another thing. It's like this awful thing that's in the paper now about statistics. You know, Gloria and I are members of the uh, nutrition committee of the district. There's 35,000 children there, and we parachuted into the Bronx back in October and November. Mm -hmm. And one of the schools that we went to to visit, I looked, and the name of it was the Diana Sands Elementary High School. Immediately I get vibes, you know, Diana, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, so much talent, you know, cut off. Yeah. No and reason. we know the reason, sure. you know, we know the reason. And she had a very rough time in the end because, you know, insurability and not being able to work and everything. So this was kind of a message. And, you know, when you go to the average school, I make one pitch, which is, come on, everybody understands that booze changes human behavior, right? Right. Everybody understands that drugs changes human behavior, sure. right? Right. Whether we're talking about the medicine chest or with something you get around the corner. So why should it be considered such a great big discovery of 1977 that food changes sure. human behavior? There's a reason for so, that. Right. We so you go, you go the where the, the PhDs food, are, sure. where the PhDs are, and they say, Mr. Duffy, are there any studies on that? And I say, studies that drunk stagger or studies that change <laughs> human behavior? Sure. So when I made this pitch at District 9 at the Diana Sands mm -hmm. Intermediate School, those people didn't say anything, didn't ask any of these sure. silly questions. Yeah, they said, true. right on. Yeah. And yeah, they invited us sure. to be members yeah. of their I committee. Think people understand yeah, well, you much, see, you much see, more than this. You know how I got started with all of this yeah. with, with my lovely friend over here? She told me a story about what she did during Sunset Boulevard, the tour, mm -hmm. plugging the picture. Tell about that with the, the tumor that you had. Oh. Because you'll, you'll convert a lot of people that way. I mean, that's a very important well, story. Well, uh, it was a question that uh, Four gynecologists wanted to give me his hysterectomy. And uh, the one up in Massachusetts, the top, 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 said you have to have it out um, before Christmas. That was five months away. I went back to the man who taught me uh, most of what I know about the human body and started me off in the late 20s, Dr. Beeler. Food is your best medicine. He never mm -hmm. let you even look at an aspirin. Right. And uh, so most of my information came from him. Went back to him, and he said something very simple to me. Tell me, what, uh, is the, what, what is a protein for? I said, it's a cell builder, Dr. Bailey, you taught me that. He said, go to the head of the class, that's great. He said, all right, now, uh, tell me, are you fully grown? I said, you know I'm 47. It was then 46. And he, I, he said, well, maybe you're dig digging a ditch. Maybe you're a tennis pro. Maybe you're a football player. And I'm looking at him, and I said, come on, now, don't pull my leg. What, what are you trying to say? He said, you just got through telling me that you had a bunch of uh, protein cells that didn't know what to do with themselves. And he said, maybe in your first child, this is how this happened. It sometimes takes 20 years to get a lump that size, you know. Well, that's what it probably was. At any rate, 
I said, well, then you were trying to tell me I might starve this to death? And he looked at me and smiled a bit, and he said, I think so. How long? Well, a year, two years, three. All right, make a long story short, I go on tour. And I'm going around the country eating nothing but zucchini, string beans, potatoes, uh, some rice, uh, bread that had to be made at a certain place, a pepperidge bread, when it was really made the way it should be made. This is, she started this for her one child who had asthma. This doctor had had asthma was he, when he was in medical school, and that's why he became a biochemist, incidentally. So he would, everything was cured with food. So after two and a half years of touring these United States, I tell you, all I, ha I had three women working for me, a maid whom I had to replace three times because she didn't have the energy. Uh, mind you, now I'm having no more animal protein at this point. No more animal protein. I'm having my good bread. And a cute story was that I was eating two loaves of bread a day because Pepperidge was sending it, a brown loaf and a white loaf to me at every hotel. I was only in a hotel one day. So the, new, the PR of the hotel would, of course, tell the newspaper sure. people stories about me. She eats two loaves of bread a day. So they'd ask me about this. I'd say, no, I don't. Well, why do you have to have... Because it would get green. It's so full of life. Don't you understand that if something's got life in it, the bugs want it? When they don't want it, then worry Watch about out. it. Watch <laughs> out. For it. So that's how that happened. And I might add that in two and a half years, I finally went back to this doctor in Boston who wanted me before Christmas, just before Christmas. That's because he had his book full up, you know, for other people that were going to become <clears throat> unwomaned. And so uh, I uh, said, well, I want to see him. And uh, my name was sent in, and I'm sure he expected to see me on a stretcher or 40 months looking like I was pregnant. And uh, he couldn't find anything the sure. matter with me. And then he said, uh, I said, you can't find it, can you? And he said, no, reluctantly. And I said, don't you want to know what I did? What do you mean, what did you do? I said, well, I went on a diet. He threw his head back and laughed. I said, on a non-animal protein diet. He laughed some more, and I said, now that's all right. You go right ahead and laugh. I'm not laughing because I'm still a woman. I'm not going to have a beard and I'm going to have all my innards, and I don't think you should think this is funny. You should think <laughs> this, this is very serious, so serious that I don't think you ought to send me a bill. I hoped you might have learned something, and that I woke, and that was the end What of I love about the Boston situation is we, we had butterflies in Boston, if you recall. Yes. And it was just to, dis to discuss her energy, her energy problem. 2.30 in the morning, and we were at the Ritz having a party for the cast. The reviews were wonderful. And Gloria's looking very, very... We'll rejoin the friends of Gloria Swanson after this message. She said, I want to show you something, Junior. And in the middle of my story, I'm going to give you one of these. So we were at the party, opening night, and it was 2.30 in the morning, and Gloria gives me this list, and I look at it, and our press agent, I think it was Max Eisen. Max Eisen. Wonderful guy. Uh, had prepared Live from New York, we are eavesdropping on an intimate conversation with friends of Gloria Swanson. They are Dick Gregory, consumer editor and former Pennsylvania insurance commissioner Herb Denenberg, Broadway and film producer Arthur Whitelaw, Frank Nicholas, chairman of the board and president of the Baker Beechnut Corporation. And William Dufty, <laughs> best-selling author and husband of Miss Swanson. And she'd take a dressing room on the second floor of the theater so she could run up and down the stairs. So I can you would imagine have to go up and down stairs, which is awfully good for you. Right, incidentally, on the way up in the Sunday paper, I was reading that your buddy Groucho Marx is adopting a 39-year-old girl. I'd well, ask you about that. Yeah, uh, Aaron Fleming is the girl. And it's not he's not adopting her. Aaron has, uh, well, Gloria knows Groucho. He's a... One of the most you know terrific guys. You no, don't? No, I don't know him. That's yet. shocking. No, it, it is shocking, but you'd be surprised how many the people in our business. I don't know. Well, it's funny. I introduced Groucho last year to Marjorie Maine just before she passed away. And he'd never met her. They worked mm -hmm. at MGM mm -hmm. together. And it was a wonderful thing. I, I got a kick out of doing it, saying, Groucho, I'd like... They never I'd worked like... together. They worked in the same studio. Same studio. Then, yes. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to meet Marjorie Main. <laughs> he turned to her, and he said, where's your mule? She said, with your duck. <laughs> <laughs> he's a terrific... I will answer your question, Herb. He's uh, not adopting her. He, what he's... Uh, um, she's given him a terrific lease on life in the last 10 years. I did a show with 
Groucho some years ago called Minnie's Boys, about the same time we were doing Butterflies Are Free. And this was a man that was near death at that point. This girl came in and uh, unselfishly, I might add, to rearrange his entire staff at the house. She became a secretary. Uh, he wants to make sure that his family can, take care of her. Can't, will take care of her afterwards. So therefore, the best way legally to do that is to put her down as a daughter in his will. And uh, so that they can't, because there's an awful lot of controversy in that family, whatever especially do, about her. Whatever you do at a certain age, somebody's going to laugh. Yeah. Well, you know what, you, what they've done? They've gone to psychiatrists, and uh, I mean, not one, but like two or three to prove that he is sane and that what he's doing oh, now yeah. is something That's he wants to do and not being induced to do. Uh, he's a very. Yeah, because he's going to be tremendous. I mean, you know, <clears throat> this man's talent just grows almost like it's like, it's like you know. He's unbelievable. It's like the other one. He's 86 yeah. years old. Yeah, just unbelievable. Just he's another Dick sad. Gregory. No, no, I don't. I, you know, I wish I had that that stroke of genius. Yeah. 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 But you know what he has, Dick, and it's something I think that everybody here at this table has, which is probably why we're all friends of Gloria Swanson. There's a zest he has for yeah, life. Sure. There is a. He gets up in the morning. He walks a mile a day. Mm -hmm. Now, sure, he's feeble. I mean, he's sure. had a bunch of little strokes. How old is he? Eighty-six. He'll be eighty-seven uh, in October. Yeah. That mind is as sharp. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Mine is sharp. It is. He said he broke his hip a couple weeks ago, and they had him in uh, the what? hospital. Yes, he, did. he fell. He said he did it on purpose to get out of the house so he wouldn't have to eat his cooked food. <laughs> <laughs> well, Burns is another one. Oh, I love him. He <laughs> but look, now, there are people, we're all young, and to look up to, I want to grow old like that. I really do. And yeah. I think yes. having read Bill's book, Sugar Blues, uh, you're a convert, aren't you? Absolutely. Well, you started me. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Well, there's right. definitely a thing happen with, happening with, with, with sugar now, and, 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 and that book is like a Bible. You can walk and you can give it to people. I've got uh, so many copies. They, they keep running out. They look at me, not again. You it's know, the one thing that, that changed thing. Muhammad Ali. You hear Muhammad Ali now talking about he don't eat sugar. And I was with him. He came out and joined me when I was running from L.A. to, to New York, and he could not believe that someone... 44 years of age, uh, I'll be 45 this year, could average 50 miles a day constantly. <laughs> and then we talk. Now, you have a problem with Muhammad Ali, the same way you have a problem with what you discussed earlier, that <clears throat> you drink alcohol and you get drunk. Or you, you, you put the wrong type of drug in your body and you get a reaction. But if I took a baby and put X amount of alcohol in your baby food, or X amount of drug in your baby food. I'll show you a kid at 19 years old would not have a reaction to it overtly. Yeah. So this is what you're dealing with when you have mm -hmm. to tell people that food gives you a reaction. They start so young at it. Well, why don't they that... listen? Though? I mean, you've worked with the FDA, and there's this whole thing about about the saccharin situation now, which I'm sure you're very yeah. into also. <clears throat> why don't they take the sugar off the market? Because uh, people want it. You know, why don't they take drugs off the market? Why don't they take cigarettes well, off the Well, they don't have drugs on well, the market. Well, I think market. Congress is finally beginning to wake up. I mean, they're kind of the last repository yeah. of insights. When they get the word, everybody has the word. Right. And they came out with that Senate Select Committee right. report, which I guess even you would like. They said, well, what the American people have to do is cut down on sugar, cut down on salt, cut about down the on fat. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cut Please. down on cholesterol. And yeah. two weeks after that, you know what happened, don't you? Yes. That committee was dissolved. Well, actually, they didn't. <laughs> Did you know that? Yes. They've given it a reprieve no, I, until the end of this year. Well, I didn't know that. But you know, this was really pressure. This was really pressure. Sugar water. <laughs> on, on, on that which he uh, and his committee attempted to represent the elimination or the virtual reduction of added salt Frank, and added why, sugar. Why can't food manufacturers make money by selling good food? Why do they have to make money by selling hey, junk? It seems like knows something. precisely. Hey, your question it cost is well, more you, you, to put no, all those additives in. Oh no, no, no. You see, your question is well taken. We at Beechnut made this decision because it's not only a moral decision and an ethical decision, sure. it's a medical decision, and of course there are well, marketing the overtones. Well, you saying all your colleagues are immoral? I mean, that's what you'd have to conclude, because it seems like they're just, you know, they are, I, they are doing exactly the opposite of what any rational man would prescribe. They're loading sugar, fat, caffeine, untested food additives, everything that's bad, that's what we get in, right, Herb, you, you, you know why one of the many reasons that we took action was that people like you, consumerists, people such as you, Miss Swanson and Dick and Bill, who have 
taken the position and have held firm on their ground that added sugar is bad. Sure. And what is happening now, we are enormously encouraged by the fact that young gals who have left the purchase of, of commercial baby food and have begun to make their sure. own baby That's food. Right. Yes. When we announced that we took the added salt yeah. and the added sugar out of our baby food, these gals are coming back and buying our product. Right. It is very common for us to go into a supermarket or in a controlled panel, and these young gals have got the labels and they're reading it. And if it says added salt or added sugar or MSG or HVP or something that they can't pronounce or understand, they don't buy it. Sure. I am enormously enthusiastic about what is happening. And a healthier race of people. To these yeah. young people. And, and, and I don't want to get, you know, overly excited about it. But do. What, do. We're do. Do. what we're attempting to do no, is to start these young people out Somebody with, guts. with no added salt and no added sugar. And by golly, they're not going to like added salt and they're not going to sure. like added sugar. So when they taste it, it's going to taste bad. You know, getting back to what you were saying before, Dick, about your folks. I have two remarkable parents and uh, who are wonderful. And they never deprived me of having anything as a child. Sure. I could have liquor. I could have wine, I could have beer, I could have, I could smoke, I could have anything I want. I didn't want any of it because of that. It was like, you know, make it hard for somebody to what get What was your they problem? Huh? I, had, I went into the theater, that was my problem. <laughs> Herb, to answer your question, to specifically zero in in an attempt to answer your question, I think the producers of food are becoming more conscious, but I think we need continued organizations such as the Senate Select Committee, sure. we need continued action on your part, Bill, on yours, Miss Swanson, and yeah. Dick. And Herb, you're in a very enviable position. My goodness, he, he you have an incredible car. reputation as in the insurance commissioner of Pennsylvania. You were just an absolute iconoclast in the insurance industry, and the people in Pennsylvania love you, and you know that. Did you know he's written a couple of booklets, consumer booklets, on surgery? in which he gave a complete book on, on what to be aware of in surgery, suggesting there was a lot of surgery going on. This guy is tremendous, and now he's in a position of being a consumer editor. He's down in the Philadelphia area, doing a fantastic job of bringing these things to the attention of the people. And I can tell you that one of the main reasons that we took the action that we did was the fact that people were talking about there's it. There's a market out there. Now. People sure were talking about it. Do you market, know any no. fabulous yeah. market? An unbelievable. People vote at the market. supermarket. That's what I've been told. Yeah, but yeah. can you make them talk about it when the advertisers really control a good bit of what goes on TV and what goes on onto the newspapers, what goes yes, into the magazines? Because, you know, I, I I actually believe so because people such as you, the editors of the newspapers, the gals on the talk shows. And the consumer activists, the gals in the chain stores, you know, each chain, major chain has a vice president of consumer affairs, and these gals are really telling the people who run the chains about this bad uh, uh, additive and this bad. And I can absolutely and unequivocally tell you that if these people keep making the noise, sure. keep talking, yeah. they've the got to publicity. There are lots of them in the media now. Oh, we were shocked when we went around to 35 cities and we found practically everyone that was about to interview us was really aware of what's going on and they're ready to fight. Ms. Swanson, what you're hand. doing and what Bill is doing in the area of sugar is just absolutely remarkable. Yes, yes. I could I'm... tell you stories that, of, of things that have happened to us and when we took the added sugar out, people that have written to us and talking to us about the things, it's just you know, the interesting thing we have as we start these babies out and we can really have a whole new generation. Sure, the babies are sure, going back to the mother's breast now, and they're having natural childbirths so that they sure. can start out whole oh, in the world. Great. You can Would you eat some sugar, yeah. Frank? Herb, <laughs> 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 <Herb, laughs> I, no, I want to ask you something. By the way, there's no sugar in those. Things. No. no. Yeah. And these, wanna, are, these are wonderful brand yeah. muffins that Gloria wants. Thank you. David made them. David oh. Graydon made them. Yeah. I want to ask oh. you something if you know about, because this gets into your field, the insurance business, about a man up in Santa Barbara called Pritikin who has a place up there called a Longevity uh, Institute Research and so on. Now, people who need surgery, heart surgery and bypasses, he had a, a thing with one of the insurance companies where he made a bet with them. 
And he said, would you rather pay 21000 or 31000 for a heart operation, or would you rather take, why don't you take care of the bill here for a month, which is only 2700 or $3,000? And they said, you can't do it. He said, I'll wager you, you don't have to pay me a cent. In one month, their patient that they were talking about was running and walking oh, sure, sure. Uh, eight miles. We were talking to him for one hour on the phone the other day, Bill and I, and that's only one patient, and out of a hundred, they haven't had any any of them that weren't able I to do it. I asked my doctor. I even, your, even your pilots now are going up there. Now, the insurance companies, as Bill says, it would seem simpler for them to pay a small fee like that than, and, and keep people well oh, sure. and get their money from them each year on, an, on a policy than to have to pay all I these agree. great... Well, now, of course, it takes them about 30 years to do the obvious, so right. you should be sure by the year, you know, 2010. Oh, you're not going to be around to see <laughs> You'll be there. You'll be there. You'll be there. You'll be but you're there. right. The, the insurance companies are geared up to pay for surgery and hospital sure. care and everything that's expensive. In fact, our whole medical system, doctors used to complain to me. They'd say if a surgeon goes in there and shops somebody up, he gets paid $1,500 by Blue Shield. But if I give a guy a complete physical and tell him that he doesn't need surgery, I get $25. So we've got this whole engine churned up that's geared to give sure. people yeah. surgery and drugs. Instead of telling them a few simple things, you know, for $3, you could tell them about nutrition, about exercise, about some of these other yes, things that would probably save their week, life. Her, her, uh, when he went to medical school, how many courses he had in nutrition? He said none. He can you imagine that's, that? Listen, this is an actual yes, I can fact. Imagine that. Now you... what is happening in this area, just within the last two or three years, we have a woman who is a consultant to us who is a head of the nutritional sciences department of a Midwestern university, a state school, who told me that for 15 years she has attempted to get the medical school to give just one course in nutrition mm. to the medical students. But there has been a dramatic change in this within the last two or three years. Mm -hmm. I think the latest figure I showed, I've seen is about 48% of the medical schools are now training the medical doctors in nutrition. Thank they God. have to get this beyond Thank the medical God. school. That's right. I had a very interesting Well, they better start it on themselves, the doctors, and eat properly, because they look like death they themselves. Can't. <laughs> yeah, it would be nice. You're going to somebody and say, save my life, and you think he's going to die anymore. It would be nice. You know, but the burden cannot be on the doctor. The burden has to be on that patient that goes in there and see that. Well, I had true. a very, I tell you what happened to me. Uh, about three years ago, Wayne State Medical a school in Detroit, which I didn't know at the time, is probably the one of the oldest medical schools, like 125 years of graduating doctors. And it was a choice between a Dick Gregory or a, a, uh, a senator. And the school wanted the senator because they were celebrating the 125th anniversary and doctors was coming in from all over the world. And the letter I received was, well, it was kind of hostile, and it wasn't hostile. It wasn't the type of letter you write somebody if you really want them uh, to be the commencement speaker. <laughs> so I didn't answer them. And I find this out after I get there, you know. I said, you know, I found a lot of hostility when they picked me up at the airport. They said, well, it's because they really didn't want you. Uh, we wanted you. And when you didn't answer the letter, they thought that was their way out. And uh, they said, well, Dick Gregory didn't answer the letter. And the kid said, if Dick Gregory didn't answer the letter, that means he's coming. And they got on the phone, and they called me. And... What I put to that graduating class is this. If you were told today that your mother or your loved one was in a hospital or a tavern getting drunk, you would feel much better knowing they're in a tavern getting drunk than in a hospital because fewer people die in taverns drunk than in hospitals trying to get well. Now, you know, now you just put this out. When are you going to run for and senator, Dick? I think you ought to run you with that platform. Well, I think what we have to do, and it's very important, I told you earlier, we really have to talk, because we cannot sit and take this and decide, excuse me, that we're going to get people into this, you know. If we are, then we're saying that 200 years of doing what you're doing, you know, didn't affect me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have to look and turn it around. I talk every night to thousands of people, and I slip them into a food thing. Ten years ago, I mentioned I'm a vegetarian. They clapped. It was, it was your thing. Now there's an audience out there. And I approach it this way. I said, you know, as long as the Russians is not doing it to us, it's okay. 
Mm. If the Russians put red dye number two in our food, we would have been at war. <laughs> if, if, you know, the CIA's admitted that they was testing germ warfare in New York subways, and it went totally unnoticed. If we caught a Russian spy today, and that Russian spy admitted under the Justice Department deal, if you tell the truth, we'll let you go, admitted that the Russians was practicing germ warfare in the I New York subway. I knew there was subway, a reason I didn't take the subway. You know, <laughs> so just... that we would be outraged. Now, my problem is this. It seems that the, the, the white American mentality in America today feels the same way about communism that black folks used to be about the ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> and now, that's not derogatory because if we would have had billions of dollars and as much power as white America have, we would have spent billions of dollars for early warning ghost detectors and <laughs> surface to air ghost missiles and I'm sure we would have landed a black on the moon and say, baby, any ghost is up there. <laughs> now, you know, but now, we're not going to be, you, you know, you can't scare people. What we're going to have to do, remember the Vietnamese war. You know, just saying the war was bad didn't swing it. No. It's when those kids start getting their bag together and having that hardcore research and sitting down talking and then little by little, even that one over there that was for it, it switched around. And this is the same thing going to happen with food. You see, what they're not telling us, about three years before the Vietnamese war was over, we heard about the kids that went to Canada and the kids went to Europe. What they didn't talk about is five out of every six prisoners that went to federal penitentiaries was draft resistors mm -hmm. to the extent that they had to stop prosecuting them. Now, what, what caused that? It was an educational problem. It was a growth problem. It was you keep on and you keep on Riding and you keep away. on. Of now, but is there any hope of getting the public educated? No. Well, that seems to me that seems to me our, our problems no, no, are no being question. created faster yeah. than they're being solved. No I really don't see much hope. Yeah, well, I, I promise you. See, once you unthread that mm -hmm. first ravel, you know, once you pull that first ravel. For instance, three. I had a guy just call me from here in New York. He says, "Wow, we ought to hold a press conference because." Uh, uh, they just busted the, uh, I don't want to call the name because I might be running, one of the banks. And he said, you was doing that three years ago. I used to come to this town, and I started doing it nationally, saying this. I can get all the drug pushers off the street. I don't need a cop. I don't need no money. All I need to do is go to the bank. Now, why? Let's say if we control the drugs in this town, let's say it's 50 to $100 million a day, right? Now, the people that's buying those drugs pay $1 bills, fives, tens, and twenties. Can you imagine what $50 million and fives, tens, twenties, and $1 bills would look like, right? So in order to stay in business with that type of money coming in at that volume, you have to go to the bank every morning and change small bills for big bills. So now all you have to do is go to the Federal Reserve Bank. I don't need no cop. Go to the Federal Reserve Bank and look at their records and see where those big bills are going and where the small bills is coming from. And you automatically... Well, so now, what I'm saying is, we keep looking for something big. You know, it's a thread. You know, my mother, you're telling me... Now, I, I got into vegetarianism accidentally because of the Civil Rights Movement. But now, you're going to tell me that I can't eat sugar. You're not going against me. Don't you're going against my mother. <laughs> my father, sure. my grade school, my high school, and my church. Somewhere down the line, all of these people that cared about me never told me this. Now, this is what we're dealing with. Until we understand, this is what we're doing. And that's why what you're doing is so important. That's why every time you're on TV, because we got them moving. We got them bent over here now. And here's what's going to break it. Them. Here's what's going to break it. When you create that market, for it. I sit and Which I say, what you're doing. That's right. Mm, yeah. that's what when you're you doing. create that market for it, here's what's going to happen. If we're not careful, and I told you this when we, we first got together in our first long discussion, if we're not careful, the same companies that's putting all the mess out here <laughs> with no integrity is going to lead the health food industry sure they because will. if all the people that we would like to see switch over in the morning and say, okay, let's do it. It's money. Okay. It's if money liquor money. and whiskey and cigarettes and gum and candy was as hard to find as health food stores, I probably would have never had a drink. Hey, speaking of food, are you yeah. fasting, Dick? I've been on fast now since the 20th of January. What are you fasting about? Uh, I'm fasting in protests against the Kennedy King assassination, the investigation. What's happening with that? Well, I think it's beginning to happen now. I, I think what had happened is Congress really decided that they were going to open it up, both of them. And right after that, a funny thing happened. 
we start getting leaks that come out. And uh, Attorney General Mitchell mentioned today that they're going to have an investigation about this blackmail. Now, nobody's saying what the blackmail is about. I think I know what the blackmail is about. Congress voted overwhelmingly to open up the Kennedy King assassination. Right after that, we start getting leaks that the South Korean CIA, which is nothing more but an extension of the American CIA, have been bribing between 100 to 150 Congress people. Now, that's a heck of a threat. Now, after that, the Kennedy King assassination started running into problems. And so when the inauguration, the day of inauguration, I sent uh, Mr. Carter a telegram saying that I felt that probably one of the number one domestic issues today is the Kennedy King assassination. Let me tell you why I say this. We're going to crack the Kennedy King assassination. And then your job's going to be easy because there's a lot of people that would never believe they're doing this to food. There's a lot of people that just cannot believe that the government would sit by and let laws be pushed through that go against my health. Now, once, and the beautiful thing about what's happening now, and I found this whole food game is much easier now since Watergate. Mm -hmm. right, you see, exactly. you, you start <clears throat> unwrapping. Sure. Now, what happens is, I said to the president that I feel that your administration should put its weight behind a Kennedy King assassination, and I think it's so important that I vow, as of today, your inauguration, that I will not eat any more solid food until that investigation is held and the truth is known once and for all. Now, that could be four years. I hope not. The longest I've ever gone without any food is two and a half years. Uh, I don't want to go four years, but I think it's that important, and it would cut my job and our job short once we get this investigation, because once that happened, then you can start saying to the American, you know, I am outraged. Now, I'll get back to the assassination. I'm outraged over the fact that we hear all this about Cyprus, mm -hmm. and no one is talking about what it's made from. Right. That alone, coal tar. coal tar, that is so poison that if they threw it in the water, it would kill fish. If you put it in the ground, you couldn't plant nothing there. Plus, the other thing, and it really sounds good to sit and hear on the news and on discussions that those mice and those rats was injected what would be equivalent to you drinking 800 bottles of pop. But now what is not explained that when you take a mouse this size with a two-year life expectancy and you have to prorate that to a human being with a 60-year life expectancy and our weight, 800 bottles of pop would be equivalent to the amount that the American people drink. See, it, it makes it sound so outraged. Well, actually, so Dick, if, if you read the press release that the Food and Drug Administration put out, you've got to conclude that they were deliberately trying to sabotage the whole program. I have no doubt Because about they that. never explained it. In other words, if they would have explained the fact that if a substance causes cancer, it's going to cause it in a big dose sure, or a small that's dose. right. And if they would have explained that we have to give them big doses because we can't run a sample of a million. In other words, if you have, say, 1% of the rats are going to get cancer and you run a small sample, you don't prove anything. And therefore, the only way to proceed scientifically is to give them a big dose and use a small sample. Right. But they explained absolutely nothing. What they really stressed was that we gave all of these rats this tremendous dose and they got cancer and therefore we're banning it. Sure. They also completely omitted that there were a lot of other important studies. They actually omitted that the safety of saccharin has been questioned since 1900. <laughs> they omitted right. everything yes. to indicate that the decision was a sound one. And of course there's a big outrage, but it was actually engineered by the FDA. You know, you know, know my problem is the, this. The New York Times editorial on this subject was particularly revolting and disgusting this time. And I, I know a lot of people that I know are so tired of them on this whole subject on medicine with their you know, cheap uh, police reporters, uh, disclaimer, doctors say, doctors say, doctors say. We'll rejoin the friends of Gloria Swanson after this message. Well, I'm not drinking. I'm convinced. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm convinced that the number of women who have stopped making their own babies... Live from New York, we are eavesdropping on an intimate conversation with friends of Gloria Swanson. They are Dick Gregory, consumer editor and former Pennsylvania Insurance Commissioner Herb Denenberg, Broadway and film producer Arthur Whitelaw, Frank Nicholas, chairman of the board and president of the Baker Beechnut Corporation, and William Dufty, best-selling author and husband of Miss Swanson. The number of gals to me is a barometer of the people, the women 
who represent an untold, we, we grossly underestimated the number of these gals. And I really think the groundswell is here, but we haven't had enough indicators here yeah. to four dimensions. Course, the problem is it also pays to lie. I mean, you're giving us one example where it pays to tell the truth. But if you look at the successful advertising campaigns sure. and the labels of the food industry, the greatest stuff are really lies. In other words, they're really misrepresenting and misleading the public. I have a whole series of, I call them Orwellian inversions. You can buy all these famous products like Mazzola, Wesson Oil. It says pure on it. Loaded with all kinds of additives. <laughs> so you go right down the list, and it's exactly the opposite 20. of the label. <laughs> sure. If you look at all the, the successful advertising campaigns, they're all baloney. You know, extra strength, that's the hottest thing going. Now, extra strength just means it's a bigger pill. So the ultimate is going to be an aspirin the size of a watermelon. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, it pays to lie. And I actually think your campaign may be an exception. The rule is, if you analyze what they're advertising to the American people, in fact, Benton and Bowles is running this nationwide uh, advertisement. Have you seen it on the six things that every advertisement should have? And the one thing they don't talk about is truth. They say it has to be believable, but they don't say anything about sure. the advertisement. It has to be true. And many of the things that they cite, frankly, in my opinion, they're products that have really been misrepresented. The I American started making hey, my, my own mayonnaise and my own bread because I don't like what's on the market. Yeah. You are in such an incredible position now. I'll probably be fired after this program. No, no, I don't believe it. <laughs> You're in such an incredible position. Do you know why the medical schools are giving the doctors training in nutrition? Because the consumers are demanding information from the medical profession. These guys are getting an enormous I amount of information. I thought they gave it to them because they were embarrassed because their secretaries knew more about nutrition than we did. I want to hear the reason. Want to, no. They knew more about the, the New York Times, <laughs> Bill's, Bill's yeah. remark. No, I'm just saying that the phenomenon of the supermarket dropout, which is what I call mm -hmm. them, is something we understand of voting at the sure. supermarket. But I want to say that a lot of people who have quit reading the New York Times are not just unhappy actors about Clive Bonds. A lot of people are just really, the Times is nowhere on this whole Well, I'm unhappy there. that he's not reviewing anymore. I think that's, that's his guy. Um, Don't you think it's one of the great papers, though? I mean, I think yes. the, the Times, despite all of its shortcomings, I hate to say this about mm -hmm. really, in a sense, a competitor, because I write for the Philadelphia mm -hmm. Bulletin. It's a great paper. But in terms, you just can't function. In fact, anything the Times prints becomes news because it's... It, it's viewed what, that's with such importance, yeah, but, and it also it that's covers what makes it so dangerous. No, but it also yeah, covers course, the waterfront. Yeah. I mean, other papers could do that, but they just don't. You know, it's the know, only paper that really go covers back, the entire New York that's Times. Now, I think that's now a myth. If you I would go back and compare the did. New York Times on the Kennedy King assassination, mm -hmm. it's almost open hostility to that committee. Now, it wouldn't be bad if, from the beginning of that committee. It was uh, a relationship that we needed. It was never there. It was always buried. The minute the trouble starts, mm -hmm. then you start getting these tremendous articles, and it and it has a tremendous effect. I think that's good, though. On the mind. Well, here's here's. Incidentally, here's, would you trust you know, Congress I, to conduct such an important well, investigation? They can't do anything else, right? No, Why could they conduct see, an investigation? I trust properly. Richard Sprague. I think the one mistake that Richard Sprague probably made, and it's an honest mistake. And then again, I think it goes back to our mentality. Mm -hmm. He said, we need $13 million for a two-year period to investigate the Kennedy King assassination. Everybody said, that's too much money. Now, we give King Hussein $200 million a year for 20 years to put in his hip pocket, but we won't loan New York City $100 million to keep cops and firemen and hospitals open. Now, what Sprague, I think, and I think it was a touchy area, I don't think Sprague was ready to say that we have information that the CIA and the FBI haven't played square with us. Now, I don't know at this point. Now, I, I know they were involved, but I think Sprague in that position. What do you mean you know? I, that's what I said. I what know. Do you have a theory? Why don't you lay it you know, out? I will, but I, I really want to say what's, what happened. I think happened okay. to Sprague. That he can't come out and say, because the CIA and the FBI have a lot of friends in Congress and in the Senate, he can't come out and say, I know that they didn't play straight with us. But what he was trying to say is, I cannot use the FBI and the CIA for these two investigations. Mm -hmm. Now, let's forget about the $13 million. Let's say that we investigate in something that we don't think the CIA and the FBI was involved with, right? Now, 
if we as a committee, we can go and use the CIA and the FBI and untold millions of dollars for our investigation will show on their budget. But now, if you think the CIA have not been honest with you, you know, you take the Kennedy assassination. <clears throat> uh, Jack Ruby said to three officials on that Warren committee in Texas, if you take me out of this jail, I will blow the lid off of this. Take me back to Washington with you. But if you leave me here, they'll kill me. We'll get back to you later. They never got back to him. Jack Ruby's dead. What's important, who were those three? Mm -hmm. A congressman from Michigan named Gerald Ford, Earl Warren himself, mm -hmm. and an unknown individual at the time named Leon Jaworski. Mm -hmm. Now, when you start looking and seeing, now, uh, Mark Lane and I just finished a book on the Kennedy assassination. You know what's so interesting about it? I mean, the King assassination. When will it be out? It'll be out the 1st of May. But here's what's interesting about it. We got over $100,000 for the book. The book will make millions. Now, we will, for the first time, create a legitimate market where people can start coming up with hardcore information, and there's a market for it. Now, that's what's very important. We will do talk shows all over this country because of this book. Now, what happens is this. Mark Lane was able to get in and interview James Earl Ray. First time this has happened, right? Two days after we get the interview with James Earl Ray, the Attorney General Mitchell says he wants to interview James Earl Ray. Two weeks later, Bell. Uh, I mean Bell, I'm right. sorry, Attorney General Bell says he wants to interview James Earl Ray. And then CBS did a beautiful story show on James Earl Ray. And one thing keeps coming out of what James Earl Ray says. James Earl Ray says that it was a conspiracy, that he was a patsy. Well, if you're a patsy, who set you up? And he keeps talking about a guy by the name of Raul, named Frenchie. Now, this is very important, this picture here. This picture here is a sketch, right here. I'll show you, right here is a mm -hmm. sketch. The FBI sent this sketch across America, the Night King was shot, of a composite of what the witnesses said the murderer of King looked like, mm -hmm. okay? Now, this sketch do not look like James Earl Ray. It looks like this individual here on my left. Now, who is this individual here? I'm betting it's Frenchie, Raul. Now, where did this picture come from? Now, who is Raul supposed to be? I mean, how... That's as close as, as, as anybody know now. Mm -hmm. It's just, it, he's only been identified as Raul. Ray won't say that. Ray don't know anymore. That, know was, anymore. that was the name. That's I the see. money spot. I but see. what's interesting about this and why this picture have to be investigated thoroughly, you know where this picture was taken? Of this guy right here? That's compared to composite? It was taken on the grassy mall of three so-called tramps that got arrested five minutes to an hour after President Kennedy was shot. Now, why then can there be left any doubt? No one. I carried this information to the, 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 the Rockefeller Commission, you know, with the pictures. All they said was, these, we don't know who it is. It is very important when you have three so-called tramps, and when you investigate those pictures, they weren't tramps. You could tell by the, the clothes the they were wearing. Yeah. All right. Now, when you, what happened in Texas? They were arrested, booked under a John Doe, not fingerprinted, released, and there's no records. Now, you cannot talk about having a thorough investigation, especially when this picture keeps showing up with Martin Luther King's assassination. What is it? The, what, what, what's the solution to this? What, what do you recommend be done? The solution is this: that one, I would like to see the working press do the same thing with this now that happened with the investigative reporter mm -hmm. that right. was killed in Arizona. And it will be so much coming. Now, I'm not a reporter. I really don't know that much about investigating. I just, I, I haven't got nothing left, right? <clears throat> Let me tell you what we found out for the Martin Luther King book. We find out that <clears throat> five minutes after King is shot, in front of the rooming house, they find a bedspread with a rifle in it, with some underwear in it, and with a transistor radio, okay? Now, this is shipped that day, the same day King is hit, to Washington, D.C., to the FBI laboratory. Now, what did they find on that? Now, no one knew what they found until the Freedom of Information Act, and you can start getting documents, right? Now, before I tell you what they found, remember this, 15 days after Martin Luther King was killed, the FBI sent out an all-points bulletin for the murderer of Martin Luther King 
uh, uh, a guy by the name of Eric Stovall Galt. Okay, now that's very important because now with the Freedom of Information Act, for the first time we can find out what the FBI found on those documents. They found James Earl Ray's thumbprint on the rifle, but they found James Earl Ray's laundry markings in the underwear. The radio was a transistor radio that James Earl Ray owned in the Missouri State Penitentiary and it had his serial number on it. Okay, oh, yeah. now how can you have this information uh, within an hour after King is hit and deliberately sit out an all points bulletin for someone else other than that name? Now, Martin Luther King... They had was, this within the hour. They had that within the hour. Now, we know it was planted because Ray was used as a patsy, so right. you would drop this kind of stuff there. You know, no one's going to shoot somebody and run out the hotel with, with, with all of this stuff and drop it right there where the police can find it. I within five so. minutes after King was hit, they found this. Now, let's take another step. When James Earl Ray escaped from the Missouri State Penitentiary, he literally, I mean, this might sound like an exaggeration, his whole life of crime, James Earl Ray had never committed a crime and wasn't caught within 30 minutes of his whole life of crime. Now, we, we're looking at one of the crimes of the universe, of the, of the history of this planet. And when they arrested him in London, England, he had three different passports on him of three different Canadians, of which he looked like each one of them, and one of them was a cop. Now, how do you do this by yourself? Two. When James O. Ray escaped from the Missouri State Penitentiary, the Missouri State, Penitenti the Missouri State Penitentiary sent the wrong fingerprints out on Ray. So did the FBI. The FBI now have admitted the first time in the history of the Bureau that they accidentally sent the wrong fingerprints Excellent. out on a jail escapee. Taking the wrong, in a hospital, taking the wrong you know, Now, why was Kennedy in, 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 why was King in Memphis the second trip? The first trip, Martin was in Memphis, and he was very pressed because he was fixing to run a poor people's campaign. And he was trying to get the Congress and the Senate to give him the necessary uh, <clears throat> papers, uh, permits, to be able to bring hundreds of thousands of poor people. Now, he went into Memphis, and he really didn't have time to go there. He went into Memphis to lead a march, and he was going to go in, lead the march, and he was through with it because he had to get these poor people's campaign together. The march broke up into a bloody ride. A young black group of what we thought at the time was hoodlums and thugs called the invaders started the ride. And it really looked like just a bunch of militant black cats that was upset with nonviolence and we're gonna do it our way. Now, now, eight years later with the Freedom of Information Act, we find out with government documents that the invaders was FBI provocateurs that was paid by the FBI. Now, Martin, was killed in the Lorraine Hotel. Martin has no business being in the Lorraine Hotel because Martin Luther King checked in the Holiday Inn. And this is normal for the leader and his close staff, and then all the other people come in to be in another hotel for a strategy, certain and everything, right? right? The FBI now have admitted that they leaked to the Memphis press this story. The great black leader is spending his money with white folks and not with black folks. And that story and King's kindness and his goodness was so embarrassed that forced him to move to the Lorraine Hotel. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, that's, not, that, that's not all of it because it even gets to the point can't where... can't wait to read your book. Yeah, it, 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 is, it, is, it is so outrageous that had King not been involved with a poor people's march, the ride breaks up, the demonstration breaks up to a ride. He cannot go to the Congress and the Senate and say, hey, you know, I couldn't lead 600 people down the street without fighting. How can I bring hundreds of thousands here? So he was forced to go back there. And so these are the things that we're able to bring out in this book. We also got Mark Lane's documents from the CIA where his book, Rush to Judgment, and the Freedom of Information Act, Mark Lane now have CIA documents that say how they tried to stop his book, how they wrote reviews, how they... We'll rejoin the friends of Gloria Swanson after this message. But it just occurred to me, just on a light note, here we are, five guys sitting with one of the most beautiful women in the world. Why aren't there any oh. other ladies here? You know, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> I've always lived in a, in a, uh, in a man's world. world. <laughs> and fought them, too. That's <laughs> beautiful. I remember what you used to talk to the stagehands about all the time. What, what did I Well, you, she was on this whole thing, you know, yeah. about the assassination. We went to Washington, in fact, the two of us. Remember that time about the... the uh, she's a real cause fighter. 
A real person. I want you to know that I spent over a year and a half of my life in 1958 investigating this cat. Mr. Jack Uber. Mr. Jack Uber. Yeah, well, I think... And I've, I've met Mark Lane before. You know, i never forget meeting Mark Lane. He was in a courtroom in New York, and I saw this young guy walking in, and he walked right into court, and he threw his coat down in a certain way, and I went up to him and said, what's your name? He said, Mark Lane. I said, I want you for my lawyer. He said, why? He said, I never... If I were the judge, I would convict you of contempt of court for just the way you walked in and threw your coat. <laughs> and that's the kind of lawyer I want. Well, you know, when you sit and look at this, it's almost like a comedy on Broadway... That you know, you out of talk all about the problems. A comedy on Broadway because I want to, you it won't make a musical deck. Tell us about your we could. You think we could. You know, just make a musical on, and it'd be really a comedy musical on the fact that we wanted to finance the SST, and we didn't get it through, and the French did. Now we don't want it. <laughs> now, now we are leading people to believe that all the nuclear testing haven't messed up the ozones. You know that all the jet vapor streams haven't messed up the ozones. A little bitty can. Now, I'm not saying the can is good, but the, the, the comedy and the humor is how can a little aerosol can, how can some little woman with tennis shoes on in the basement with some roach powder trying to kill a roach squirts aerosol can with the roach powder and they telling me that this stuff comes out the basement through the first floor, through the second floor, through the roof, through the atmosphere, the stratosphere, grabs the ozone and destroys it and the roach is still crawling in now, the basement. that would make a music. <laughs> well, I would, please. <clears throat> Because I, I want Frank to hear, and I want Herb to hear, when it's opening, because I want to invite them back. Oh, my new They're show? They're from out of town. Tell us about it. Well, I did a show some years ago called You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, which maybe you saw. My whole thing about it, it's like food. I like pure, pure things for the fa whole family to see, too, which is my whole approach to the theater. I'm the youngest producer. You can't bring the whole family Probably to young, it. Young, you know? yeah. Yeah. How old are you? Disgustingly. 37. Oh, you really? Yeah. Yeah, but you've been at it for a while. 20 years? Oh, yeah. More than that. Yeah. What, Incredible. You, 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 20 years you've been at this? Uh -huh. You and Liza Minnelli made your debut together? We did, yeah. Liza turned 16 during Best Foot Forward, which huh. was uh, wow. 14 years ago. Isn't that fantastic? 20 oh, years I don't of want to hear about the, new the new show is called The Utter Glory of Morrissey Hall. It's by Clark Gessner, who wrote Charlie Brown. Mm -hmm. It's very, very um, basically, uh, it's about a girls' school in England and the the struggle between the classes, the upper class and the lower class. It's somewhat like uh, the Bells of St. Trinian's. Yeah. And it's for the whole family. I'm doing that. That opens in uh, Massachusetts. Where? In, uh, at Brandeis. Mm. This summer. July. Listen, you know, we went to the theater. We hardly ever go. We don't, we make a rule now. We don't go until two friends of ours. Recommend you know, the Recommend it. And uh, Sylvie Drake came in from New York uh, for the Los Angeles Times and sent She's us a bright to lady. a thing called... Excuse Savages. me. Savages. A marvelous play called Savages by yeah. Christopher Hampton. Mm -hmm. And I hope somebody brings that to off Broadway, Broadway for no, a permanent run. This was a real mm -hmm. knockout. Tell us some more about your place. place. Well, we're going to do that. Uh, it's going to be directed by Nagel Jackson, who's uh, a very talented young director, who's been the uh, head of the Milwaukee Rep for the last five years. And uh, Pat Birch, who staged Charlie Brown, is going to mm -hmm. stage it. I'm going to produce it. I'm directing another play, which opens uh, the 21st of next month, called Save the Seeds, Darling. Sort of apropos what, what kind of part do you have for Gloria? I <laughs> wish I had a play for her. We had more fun with butterflies <laughs> yes, than the we free. Did. We, did. we traveled all over this Are country. you in the market for a play no, or a, a movie? Play. You know what I love? Movie, yes, or television. Her, what I loved in, in Philadelphia. I no, I'm not Philadelphia. Show. You it, love it, something in Philadelphia? Oh, I knew it was a mistake. It was Philadelphia. It was the Forest Theater, and I'm still on a Wednesday matinee, and Gloria's playing in butterflies, and I stood in the back of the theater, and there are two little old ladies sitting in the back in the last room i was standing behind them with binoculars on saying is that a real hair does she really is she really that young i mean look how young she looks is what does she take anything <laughs> and i went back and told her after mm -hmm. the show it's incredible she's more fun to work with than any of the young people i've ever worked mm -hmm. with in the theater i don't mean to refer to you as she either oh that's perfectly all right <laughs> you miss the movies i mean no but what i want to ask you okay. because before i'll give you one free question up, will you one <laughs> will you please tell me what the FDA really is in business for. Well, I'll give you one little story that tells it all. Because the American public believe they're being protected That's right. by an agency, by a department in government, and it is not ever since I've heard about it, and I guess Mr. Wiley would twirl in his grave. The American people really did. trust their government. It's, sure. it's astounding, but if you really want to lose your trust for government, all you have to do is ask them a couple questions. I'll just give you one beautiful example. I happened to interview the former head of the FDA on TV down in Philadelphia, 
and I had these vegetable oils that I mentioned, I said, how come you permit them to call a vegetable oil pure when it has BHA and BHT and polyglycerides and these other additives? So the head of the FDA, who's, who has since resigned, said, well, the word pure on vegetable oils refers to the vegetable oil and not what goes into the vegetable oil. In other words, <laughs> no. yeah, in other words, no. in other words, you could put sewage in the vegetable right. oil and it would still be pure. Now, that's absolutely incredible. I took that little statement of his and I entered it in a gobbledygook contest of the Washington Star and I won a $10 prize. Now, right after that happened, I got on to non-dairy products. And I found out that non-dairy products, of course, have dairy products in them. You take the, whatever the label says, you take the opposite. The products, how, how does my little poem go? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> At any event, let me finish the story. Uh, I wrote the FDA and I said, how come you permit them to call a dairy product non-dairy. And I got this long letter from the FDA. They said, well, the reason is that when we use the term non-dairy, that means it's not a conventional dairy product like, like cream or milk, okay. but it can still be a dairy product. Mm -hmm. So that's all you really have to do. It's like, it's like their, their uh, uh, wording of imitation. imitation. I remember my poem. If product is. labels had a nose, they'd all be Pinocchios. <laughs> <laughs> that really tells it all. And incidentally, I, I went through this routine with the FDA. I went through a similar routine with the United, U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. I found that on all methanol products in the United States, that's wood alcohol, which will kill you, cause you to go blind, they have first aid instructions that say if somebody swallows this, the first aid remedy is to take salt water. Well, it so happens that salt water, the doctors now know, if you drink enough of it, it will cause salt poisoning, dehydration of the brain, and death, which is considered a pretty serious medical outcome. Mm -hmm. So I called up the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. I said, hey, what's going on? You know, you're requiring a first aid instruction on all these products that can kill people. So they said, well, we understand the problem, but we have priorities. So I oh, filed a petition with them. I filed a petition with them, and they, they lost my petition. Sure. Finally, a member of the commission read an article I wrote, the Philadelphia Bullet, and he called me. I put the petition to them again, and they agreed to change the label. Now, just so you don't think that's a strange aberration or an exception, about two weeks later, I found a product that was regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency called mildew gas, and they had exactly the same instructions on it. If ingested, take salt water, which will cause salt poisoning, dehydration of the brain, and death. I called the Environmental Protection Agency, and I said, hey, you guys, you're requiring this first aid advice that can kill. They said, yes, we're aware of the problem, but we have priorities. So I filed a petition with them, and the good news is that they agreed to change the first aid instruction. The bad news is that it's <clears> still <throat> wrong. Yeah. Then it's so, up to us to educate the, the public. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think, I think the moral of those stories us. is that you don't have to look too hard to find out these government agencies sure. aren't doing their job. Right. And you if better you, not trust them. If you had an opportunity, how would you change the FDA? What would you go about doing? How would you? How would I you would agree with Ralph Nader. He said the big deficiency there is not budget, it's not staff, it's guts. And that's the big deficiency in government. We hear all this baloney. I think you have to add something else, Greg. Because you yeah. know as well as I do that the lobbyists go there and change their minds. Now, how do they change it? By the color of their eyes or by taking somebody to dinner or what? There was one good man, Huper, and what happened to him? The moment that there is a real policeman there to watch them, they're discharged well, or shoved well, to I one side. I think it goes back to what you and I were talking about. There has to be political organization to support these. You can't put a tough guy in the FDA and then have him get wiped sure. out. Look what happened with the... Look, anyone what happened who's in general. politics gets, gets wiped out. something happened to the Surgeon General that few people know about. The Surgeon General now, we, every time you get a pack of cigarettes, it's a message. You know, the Surgeon General has determined that cigarette smoking is dangerous to your health. There is no Surgeon General of the United States no more. There's no Betty Crocker either. Now, what happened? <laughs> I mean, that's outrageous. I mean, the super rich cigarette companies got together and wiped that job out, and there's few people in America. You know what? We'll rejoin the friends of Gloria Swanson after this message. But on every saccharin product... Where? Oh, you know, you're talking about cycling, right? Well, to me, the most incredible thing is that the American people were surprised by this ban, and yet back in 1972, the FDA was supposed to put a warning on every label. What the warning should have said is this might cause cancer, you so ought to limit you your outtake. Sacrin. 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 Right. But instead of putting an honest warning on it, they came up with this language that says, and I'm sure there isn't 1% uh, of the public that understands what it's supposed to mean. They say you're sup this is for people that want to, that have to limit their intake. For of, dietary of, of, reasons. Yes. Yeah. 
But it's very misleading because the whole idea of that thing was that you're supposed to at least limit yourself to one gram, and they were in effect supposed to communicate that this was potentially hazardous. That's a beautiful symbol of what's wrong with this country, what's wrong with the Food and Drug Administration, sure. what's wrong Everyone with Everyone thought that saccharin was good because it was a substitute for sugar, which was bad. Yeah. Well, look what well, happened. But because you... it came from the FDA saying sure. it was all right. This is the, the problem. You, I've had more fights with people you know what, another, saying the pure food and drugs. Another big problem with this whole food bit is that they get it, people get it from so many angles, they think that they everything is bad, and they don't go through the, you know, they don't try to find out what are what's the good, good additives, what's what's what are the here. bad mm -hmm, additives, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and what's it does amazing? make sense. What's amazing is to look at Gloria Swanson, who has had a career for how many years now? 60 years? <laughs> Since I was 14 and okay. a half. Now you know my birth is next week. <laughs> next week, the 27th of March. S that many years, and that kind of energy, the twinkle in her eye, the skin is beautiful. No, don't sure. do that. That the, 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 the skin is beautiful as it is. Yeah. I'll follow a her living, diet. Exactly, exa <laughs> exactly. A living, walking, breathing ad for what she says. Yeah, but you know when Which is why I was such a convert. I mean, I wanted to start sure. at my age so that when I grow older, Arthur, I'm not going to have all those infirmities. Right. The average nutritionist in a hospital or wherever is well, very look healthy, at them. You're absolutely but they right. are counting calories. They're sure. not talking about the quality of food. That's right. They're talking about the quantity how of food. How much you eat. Sure. How much. And of course, everybody's screaming Everybody that it's so expensive. You eat more than anybody I know. <laughs> She's also a very cheap date, you know, I can afford her. <laughs> uh, it's no true, that's very important. Day, huh? That's not very, what I've heard. <laughs> very important. <laughs> Government agencies. What we spend for food per week is less than the welfare budget for sure. two people in New York. May I ask you a question, Bill? Yeah. You go into a health food store today. Now, I was in a health food store yesterday, and I bought just a few little things, and the bill was over $10. Right. For the same kind of thing that if you could buy it, at a supermarket would be maybe half that amount of money. Why is that so? Why, well, why do we have to pay so much more? Well, you're, paying these, you're, you're paying these rents from where you live. You live in this very chic neighborhood, so you're paying high rent. No, I'll but move. you know, what, <laughs> but Arthur, we used to get it in paper bags and they'd go scoop up a pound I or remember. two pounds or whatever. Sure. When William was courting me, what the back doorbell rang, and here were two men with a hundred pounds of brown rice on their shoulders. Yeah, eventually, that that will come down when and the mass the public, yes, you know, reach for. But what we have to do now, and this is where you're very important, we have to start making it available. You have to bring it to me. Well, what's interesting well there's is another that, that one. We have to encourage the guard, uh, the farmer, not to use spray, so we can have our real honest to God. That's right. Sure. The soil is as sick as the people in the United States, and believe me, there's an awful lot of sick well, people. Well, you talk about all the talking to themselves people. as they walk. We also the have to get crimes. people into the political system because until they have some voice, we'll have government of the money, buy the money, and sure. the money. Right. Well, that's why it's so important that your business, for example, which is a business. I mean, you're the president Surely. of a very, very successful business. You're making money doing the right thing. Well, that's, that, that is precisely correct. Sure. And that's we are making more money doing the correct thing than we were making when we were doing the incorrect thing. I applaud thing. that. And I there's think that's there's, there's really Fred, how many dollars are following you now? How many in Well, uh, it's going to take them about 18 months to be able to follow us, our Catch competitors. Sure. So, well, even Gerber has said that reevaluating. I called them last week, and they said they're reevaluating their formula. I'm sorry about that. Perfect, all right. And <laughs> try to limit that. <laughs> Try to limit that discussion. Yeah, I That's guess true. Heinz is uh, kind of duplicated. Well, they're going to do it. We figure it's going to take them 18 months. We made the decision 18 months ago to get where we are. But what's happening to us is we are getting, our business is improving incredibly so by doing the right thing. That's this, great. Well, this yeah. is the thing that you brought out, Herb. We are doing better now that we're doing the right thing sure. than we were when you were doing the wrong thing. You know, it's like on, on Broadway, for example, you see a show like The Wiz, which is perfectly wonderful. Yeah which is a family show. There are no dirty words. You can take a kid at any age. Like when I was a kid, my parents used to take me to see. There were loads of places I could see. And it's clean. Like the food is clean. You do... You've been eavesdropping on an intimate natural. conversation so with happens. friends of Gloria Swanson. No, well, look at these flowers, sure, how beautiful good. they are. That's real. That's yeah, nature. It's good, they are, they but you know, what, where you starting, you know, if I can keep this baby pure, mm. You know, and don't have all that hypertension, and, you know, beautiful things will happen. Let me, let the me, world let me say something in... It's kind of really upset me. I was looking through a lot of articles and research, and read an article in the February issue of the Atlantic Monthly, and it kind of talked about one thing, but right in the middle of the article, they talked about a cancer virus called SV40. Oh, oh yeah. And it went on to say SV40 had been inadvertently been injected in millions of people in this country 
1962 when they thought when it was a contaminant of polio vaccine immediately i sent a telegram to the president and said you know check the article please mr president see if it's true uh, this has been a wnew tv production live see if any from new york have been violated with this experiment